Liebe Freundinnen und Freunde der UN, liebe Freunde der Martha Cooper Library, liebe Freunde der Stiftung Berliner Leben, ich darf Sie hier und heute zur ersten Buchbesprechung auf das Allerherzlichste begrüßen. Ich darf Sie begrüßen in den Räumen der UN, einem Museum, welches von der Stiftung Berliner Leben getragen wird. Ich darf Sie begrüßen zu einem Projekt, welches sich aus verschiedenen Einzelbausteinen zusammensetzt, dem Residenzprogramm, dem wunderbaren, der wunderbaren Kooperation mit der Komischen Oper, dem Programm Stadtraum Plus. Und das ist ein Programm, welches getragen wird von der GEWOBAG AG, die durch die Stiftung Berliner Leben gefördert worden ist. Die GEWOBAG AG hat 72.000 Wohnungen und somit fühlen wir uns im Standort Berlin auf das Äußerste verpflichtet. Heute ist die erste Buchbesprechung, die wir mit drei wunderbaren Gästen in Berlin ins Leben gerufen haben. Und wir werden jetzt, weil wir es in der, An in der Einladung auch entsprechend angekündigt haben, in die englische Sprache wechseln, denn so soll der Abend heute Abend verlaufen, in Englisch. Und wenn Sie mich fragen, wie eine Begrüßung dann aussehen könnte, so möchte ich Ihnen wie folgt antworten. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Martha, dear Nika, dear Matt C., dear friends of the Martha Cooper Library, dear friends of the Urban Nation, On behalf of the Berlin Leben Foundation, I would like to welcome you warmly to the first event Martha Cooper presents from street art to canvas, driven by Martha Cooper and Matt C. I'm very pleased that Martha Cooper and the street artist Matt C have agreed to take part in the book presentation tonight. And I'm certainly grateful that we were able to win over Nika for today's moderation. The initiator of the evening is the Berlin Leben Foundation, which is responsible for the Urban Nation Museum and the Martha Cooper Library itself. It is thanks to Martha that we were allowed to be responsible for the Martha Cooper Library. On behalf of the Gevelbach Fund, uh, on behalf of Gevelbach and the Foundation, I would like to express my sincere thanks for this opportunity. And furthermore, I would like to thank two gentlemen who have been positively supporting all these developments since ever. Jaime and Steve from BSA. Thanks for your support, thanks for your efforts, thanks for your loyalty. And as a matter of fact, I'm very much looking forward to further cooperation. Tonight, street artist Matt C. will present her new book, From Street Art to Candace, which will be added to the Martha Cooper Library later on. Together with Martha and Nika, the ladies will talk about the production condition of graffiti and street art. Together, they will reflect on the meaning of bookmaking and the special challenges that women still face in a male-dominated scene. Martha is the expert who has been capturing subcultural art in urban space for over 40 years. Her work will be on display in this museum until the mid of May. Her book, Subway Art, is affectionately dubbed as the Bible. Thank you, Martha, for allowing us to exhibit your life's work, and it is certainly a great honor for us and the Foundation. Matt Seed was born in Germany in 1980 as Claudia Walde. In 25 years of constant involvement with graffiti and street art, she has developed into one of the world's best street artists. She has two university degrees in graphic design and has published three books altogether. Her canvases are shown in solo and group exhibitions worldwide. Matt C., thank you very much for joining us tonight. The event will be moderated by Nika, a collaborator with Martha, who has worked with her on at least four books. Nika supports the Urban Nation Museum, Windward Walls, and Red Bull, among other things. Nika, it is always a pleasure working with you. After the discussion, which Nika chairs, there will be certainly an opportunity to ask questions and have books signed. And with that, I would like to pass on to Nika. The floor is yours, my dear.
Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Michael, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming here. And thanks all of you on the screen at home. And uh, welcome to the first talk in the MCL Presents series. So the Martha Cooper Library Presents. And um, we have Matt C here today because it was actually Marty's idea because she told me that Matt C had a wonderful new book out. You see it here from street to canvas, you can purchase the book in the front of the museum and get it signed later on, and also some of Marty's and my books for later, right? Um, the Martha Cooper Library up here is a research library, and if you haven't checked it out, go and check it out. It's uh, a million stairs up there, but it's worth it. <laughs> and. Um, well, I have two women here, and I like, you know, I don't really think they do need an introduction. I mean, everybody does know Martha Cooper, and I'm not really going deep into her bio, because if you want to know more about here, you're pretty much inside her bio. Like, this whole exhibition, everything, anything you need to know about Martha Cooper, you can find out in this exhibition. If you haven't really checked it out, go and do, because in a few weeks it's going to be gone, and it's really worth it. And um, then we have Madsy. I mean, she doesn't really need an introduction either. Like, if you talk about legendary German graffiti artists, her name is always on the list. And I think she might be the female graffiti export from Germany. I think she is, like, on the top of the list. And um, I also want to introduce the curators of this wonderful exhibition, who are right here. Get up, please, boys. <laughs> So, Jaime Rojo and Steve Harrington. <laughs> and they are also the boys behind the Brooklyn Street Art Newsletter. And that is such an extensive newsletter, and we're always impressed, like, how website. do they... Well, website, newsletter, Instagram, everything. It's like a whole thing. And it's like anything you need to know about street art worldwide, they will keep you updated. So if you haven't signed <laughs> up yet, do it. Good guys. Okay. <laughs> and, um, okay, I need a little bit, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so, so, so um, I want to start talking a little bit about Mad C's life. And your life started in a place that is like pretty unusual, in an unusual place. You were born in the GDR, but you grew up in Ethiopia, right? Yes, correct. <laughs> so how was living in Ethiopia as a child? Uh, it was a dream. I think I had a fantastic childhood. Uh, I grew up with a lot of freedom, uh, a lot of nature, um, a lot of space for creativity uh, and also I think I grew up in a very multicultural environment because we were living in a house with Hungarian people, Indian people, Ethiopian people, German people. Um, so for me from the beginning of my life it was normal that people have different color of skin, that it's normal to travel, to come together in different places and I said, think in the, in the end it set the the mark for me to where to go. So I never felt um, homesick, I always felt travel sick, I always wanted to go to places, I wanted to meet people, and I was never scared of uh, different cultures or environments. On the contrary, I was curious about it. So I think that helped me a lot, also today, yeah. And then you came back from Ethiopia, back to Germany, to Bautzen. Yeah, so you sucked. pretty much grew up in Ethiopia, so you came back to Germany, to the G which was like pretty much a foreign country. Yeah. So was it hard to like, how felt coming back to this country then after Ethiopia and all the freedom? Yeah. No, it sucked, really. Uh, it was <laughs> terrible. Uh, so I remember one of the first weeks I was back in Germany, I saw people queuing for bananas. And I was like, why are they queuing for in bananas the GDR, in yes, the GDR? Yes, yes. I hated bananas because I had to eat them <laughs> every day. They are dry and too sweet, and I don't know. I, it doesn't make, didn't make sense. <laughs> but also then I had my first day in school because I got into school in Ethiopia, actually. So my first uh, year in school was there. And then I had to go to a um, German school, and 
kids were looking at me weird because in the GDR nobody had ever really left the country except maybe for uh, Czech Republic or yeah. Russia. And I remember the teacher asking me like, okay, tell the kids where you have spent your life. <laughs> and I was looking at all these kids thinking like, they don't know where Ethiopia is. So just like, like yeah, I was in Africa. And then uh, the first day of school was really like, nobody talked to me. Everybody was just staring at me, like just as you can imagine, like in a movie. Um, so I kind of like felt like an outsider and I was in the wrong place. And, but that also meant that I understood that we are not going to go back. So I went to my parents, I was like, I want to go back to Africa. But uh, I couldn't, of course, so I had to um, find my way um, in this new environment yeah. and uh, as an outsider, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had to leave Africa because of the... Uh, of the war with Eritrea, because yes. the war started between um, Ethiopia and Eritrea, back then it was still one country. Yeah. And I re still remember the tanks going by our house, and uh, it was just too dangerous to stay. Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah. And you got into art very early on, right? When did you yeah. start and how? Actually, my mom kept all my drawings from when I was little even, like when I was a really small child. And it, it's interesting because when I think back, I don't remember too much of my childhood. I don't know how it is here with people, but usually there are only few moments that you remember. And for example, I remember every drawing that I made that was very complex. I still remember doing it. I still remember how it looked. I still oh. remember how I felt. So from a very early stage, I knew that I want to live a creative life. And when I was in school, seventh, eighth grade, I think I took extra classes next to school. So I took uh, sculpting classes, graphic design, um, watercolors, everything. So yeah. I just tried to get as much of uh, yeah, different crafts into the system to see what's, what's good for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I read in your book mm -hmm. that you had like an, an exhibition when you were 15 years old and you yes. actually won a prize. Yes, uh, I had my first solo show with 15 and wow. uh, I made like a sculpture of uh, the daughter of the sculptor in Dresden. And uh, yeah, I won a youth art prize something and all the other artists in our area, they wanted me to study art. but. I said, no, no, you guys, nobody can make a living of art. <laughs> You're just teaching me. I'm not going to live without heating in the in winter. And, you know, so I didn't dare to study art. No. OK, so you from a very young age, you thought like, no, 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 you cannot make money with art. I better exactly. study something real. Yes. I, exactly. So okay. there was never a career choice for me. No. But you also got into graffiti at a very young age. How did mm -hmm. that happen? Yeah, I was 15, and uh, a friend of mine in school gave me the book um, Graffiti Art Germany. Yeah, and from Schwarzkopf and Schwarzkopf. Exactly. Uh, and I read it in one night, and I was so fascinated because, it, you know, like, like you're a youth, you, you want to find your own identity. I was creative, I loved to travel, and there was this culture that brought everything together. Traveling, art, you know, finding your own identity, and also, like, you know, pushing your own limits and prove yourself like within a group of people. It had everything, you know, yeah. the, you know, you're against the system, against your parents, you do something forbidden. Um, so I was more fascinated by the whole culture behind it than uh, the actual painting, I think. Of okay. course, I was also fascinated by the pictures I saw, but the complexity of it all was what really caught me. And then the very next day I went and got like five really shitty spray cans from the hardware store and painted my first piece at uh, in the middle of the afternoon. Who wants to see her first piece? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me see what I can do. I think I might have taken a photo from the book. There yes. we go. <laughs> <laughs> <How did you? laughs> yes, so that was uh, some, some garage in the middle of the day. Um, you don't know what you're doing when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> no, I w but I would say... No, it's good style, right? That, you know, if, if graffiti is about writing with style, you, start, you understood it. From <laughs> I mean, you didn't just print out... Look, it's 3D letters. letters. <laughs> yeah, you, for a first piece, I think it's excellent. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, you took it. <laughs> so what's, what's the name there? Oh, yeah, that was Clyde. It was funny because I wanted to do something with my name, Claudia, but also I didn't want to be Bonnie and Clyde. I didn't want to be Bonnie. 
But I wanted to kind of like, you know, so I thought like, okay, Clyde sounds good and I can mix it with my letters, and, but I only wrote it once. I and you also, you didn't want to be recognized as a girl, right? Exactly, I that didn't want to be recognized as a woman. Okay. The, so the first five years that I painted, I never used pink and I never used a female name. See, she never used pink in the beginning. Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, I know, we, know, we know what she's talking about because yeah. sometimes you see a wall and you're like, oh, that's been done by a girl. Right. And, um, but she, like, I mean, Matt, see, she, like, you, you reduced yourself onto not using, like, did that take away from you, this, like, trying to not be identified as a girl? Maybe, but I think in the beginning I was just, uh, it was so hard to kind of like make a name and also like fight with the technique because using a spray paint, especially back then, was yeah. really difficult. I mean, now we have like luxury spray paint, but back then it was not like this. Um, and I was struggling on too many fronts, you know, like finding a name, finding a style, working with the spray cans. So I think I didn't think too much about if it really yeah, confined yeah. me, you know. And back, so and back then you thought that feminists were angry women anyway, so. Yes, <laughs> I didn't like feminists at all. I thought they were all like <laughs> bullshitting because I thought like, come on. I mean, it's every woman's fault if they are not respected. You know, I was young. I thought like the world is mine. And I didn't understand that there are, you know, boundaries that you have to yeah. overcome and that there are a lot of women who, who have paved the way for us, yeah, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. No, I've seen that a lot, like when I started organizing events for women in hip hop, there were always the young women, like you remember Aruna back in the day, oh, we right. don't need events for girls, and oh, we're emancipated, we can do whatever we want. Few years later, you know, she's been in the scene, she has like some experiences and she figured out, no, we're not emancipated and we cannot do whatever we want and we still have to fight and we do need events for women to like empower them, to give them a space to create and grow where they are fearless. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm asking you that, Marty, too, like, because I've seen it also in breakdance and B-girls, like, do we as women limit ourselves trying to be the same in order to be treated equal. You know what I mean? Possibly. <laughs> There's some of that. <laughs> Maybe. Because I remember like when we took B-girls to France, I think it was in 2006, you and I, we got some free flights and took some B-girls to France. And those girls were all like wearing really baggy <laughs> mm -hmm. clothes. Yeah. And then they saw the French B-girls wearing like skin tight clothes yeah. and big earrings and stuff. And they were like, oh, we're allowed to do that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, not everybody wants like tight clothes and earrings, but they had the feeling that to be part of the scene, they had to dress like boys. So yeah. So we should celebrate Lady Pink, for example, who immediately decided that all of her favorite colors were going to be shades of pink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And took the name pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, was not ashamed of it. And managed to make her way yeah. in what was then a pretty much 100% guy's world in graffiti yeah. and elsewhere, of course. Yeah, so was it hard? Yeah. Like, did you have, like, some experiences as a woman in graffiti where you said this was hard for me? It would have been easier if I had been a boy? Definitely. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like, I mean, the first couple of years were definitely really hard. Um, but I think it was difficult to really say, like, if it was because I was just not a good writer yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? yeah. Or if that was because I was a girl. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think that the point is, uh, it has a lot of disadvantages, but also advantages. Uh, so, for example, I was invited for Graffiti Jam. There were 99 guys and one woman so everybody focused on me it was super annoying so when there were photographers they would always take pictures of me because mm -hmm. i was the woman painting a wall you know i was even in the bravo magazine because I said, yeah terrible but <laughs> the thing is so if you were shit at what you were doing everybody saw it and everybody remembered yeah. it yeah. You, you were just not allowed to make a mistake you know but if you performed you had the advantage that everybody also remembered that you were good, yeah, you yeah. know? So it was just a lot of pressure because I just could not be bad. Yeah. I could not fail. I had to be good, you know? I understand. So this is, I don't know, like there was a lot of pressure and I can't say, you know, like, I mean, I didn't dress up as a guy in between to, you know, tell you the difference. 
Um, but of course, I also painted at night where nobody with a different name, where nobody knew that I was a woman. Mm. And I got respected for that, you know, so just what I heard. So, but yeah, it's not easy, of course. But also for me, I remember that whenever there was something bad happening or I had some guys talking shit, I was like, okay, that happened and that box is closed. So I never looked back and I always yeah. said like, okay, next, you know? I think that's also very important, not to hold on to grudges and stuff. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Onward, like Marty always oh, says. I want you to show the next slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Marty <laughs> gets impatient. I want you to see how quickly. Yeah, she like went went from this to, to that. Yes. That's like, like two years later. And yeah. that is like some crazy wild style there. <laughs> yeah, that was for the Battle of the East. That uh, was yeah. for the Battle of the East. Yes, breakdance competition. Like Battle of the Year, that was the Battle exactly. of the East. Uh -huh. Yes. Ah, okay, okay, exactly. okay. Back then, breakdance was really big. Yeah. So you had like the different areas where the battles were uh, being held and then the, the best crews would go to the Battle of the Year. Yeah. So two years later, she's mm -hmm. painting for Battle of mm -hmm. the East. Yes. You know, so <laughs> very talented. <laughs> Let's see where we go from there. Oh, the 700 wall. Have you yes. heard of the 700 wall? <laughs> yes, I see some people nodding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the 700 wall. That was like a super big project, right? How yes. long did you paint on that wall? So I painted in total four months. Um, and it was quite interesting because basically when I started painting, I was, I'm small as a person. And usually the guys that I painted with, they were taller, so their pieces were bigger. So I had to learn to paint bigger, even though I had to use a letter, for example, and to keep the flow, even though I had to use a letter. And then step by step, the walls got bigger, and I felt it very challenging for myself to see how far can you go in size. And then over the years, I painted bigger and bigger walls, and then I thought like one day, okay, how big can I go? Like, where are my own limits? And then I found this wall, and I thought like, okay, this wall is really, really massive. Back then it was the biggest I've ever seen. Um, and so I decided to try and paint this. And uh, I got a sponsorship for the spray paint because, I mean, I had about 2,000 spray cans that I could not afford myself. 2,000 spray cans, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, about six, six and a half meters high. And I painted it with a letter, most of it only with a letter. And um, then I said, okay, okay, this is a very long wall. So how can you use this, the shape of the wall to tell a story? And uh, I not only uh, studied graphic design, but also animation. And at that point I thought, okay, okay, it looks like a film strip. So when you walk along the wall, because it's, um, I think, it, yeah, it's almost 100 meters long. So if you walk along it, that it, the, a story is evolving and told. So the beginning of this wall is, um, the graffiti artist who's working on an own style. That's the laboratory scene. Yeah, you can see there's a laboratory there, yeah. and there are some lab rats that yes. are like stealing some of her graffiti. Those were the biters, yes. right? Exactly. So Running you have away the, with your You have sketches. the biters, you have like uh, <laughs> people destroying your pieces, it's all the struggles that you have yeah, in yeah. the beginning. Um, also, uh, here I used some of the like stuff on canvas I did where you already yeah. saw the abstraction. So that's all the ideas, you know, coming together. So and you you must, like, this is a very long wall. We've cut yes. it into pieces. So this is the laboratory and then this? This is the machine. So the machine is you have to produce, 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 because uh, that's what graffiti is like, right? So yeah. it vanishes all the time. So if you want to stay up, you have to keep going. So yeah. that's the machine that's producing the pieces. Is that you in front of the wall? Yes, that's jumping. me jumping. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see that little That bus? shows you the scale <laughs> of the wall, <laughs> big wall. So this is like the machine, and then? Yes, so then the machine spits out all these pieces, they go into the harbor, and then they go out into the world. So they that go was on those like ships, they be loaded on the ships. Exactly, so that's kind of like the the traveling part of the graffiti culture, that yeah. you have to go to places to paint there and show your work there to um, yeah, be get recognized. But then also the sea is rough. Yeah. So there are people crossing out your work. There comes the sea and yes. you see some under the sea, some tentacle yes. thingies trying to sink the ships. Exactly. So this is like the struggle to, to keep these things up and uh, all the stuff that's vanishing with time. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then, and then if you keep going, you make it to the big city. <laughs> and then <laughs> and it goes on train and, and it, it goes, goes out into the everything. city. So yes. this is a wonderful story. Yes. So this wall <laughs> actually is still up. <laughs> this wall has been up now. It's, well, that was in 2000. It's uh, 12 years old now. 12 years old. Of course, yes. it's not in great shape, but no. we want to go and yes. take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not far from here. No, right? it's yeah. in Halle, right? Yes, it's in Halle. It's in Halle. Yeah. So next trip, Marty comes here, we're going to go. Your boys awesome. are coming with us, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful wall. So this <laughs> was like... Yeah, it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's... <laughs> I mean, this wall could be a book. This yeah. wall could be really. a book. Really, it's, it's a story of graffiti. Yeah, it's, exactly. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so this was, I mean, you can see that she's very talented. She can paint pretty much photorealistic and she <laughs> has like a great style with letters. And um, so this wall, after this wall, did it change for you? Did you then start doing different things? Yes. For me, it like, uh, I have this one from 2008. That was yes. before. That was before the seven. That was before. One. Then that's already when I started experimenting because yeah. for me it was important to control the spray can and yeah. not the spray can controlling me and my art. So yeah. I wanted to achieve a level um, of control that I could paint anything I ever wanted. Yeah. So that I'm really free. That I'm not dependent on. I cannot paint this. I can. Yeah. You know? I know. I know. So, so. and after um, the 700 wall. I tried so many different things. Like so this is after the 700 wall. Exactly, that's after. That I said like, okay, so I've tried everything. I've achieved so much, more than I ever could imagine. So where is me? So wh like, where do I come in? Because graffiti has so many rules. I mean, Martha yes. has seen it, you know? Yes. Like, y you know, like, uh, this is a wild cell, this is an outline, this is a bubble letter, blah, 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 blah. You yeah. know, like, in a, in a way, it sounds very free, but it's not, you know, like, you, you get this straight jacket on and you have to play by the rules. And I just wanted to challenge myself to see how can I break these rules? What do I have to, to be myself? Yeah. And then I just um, tried stuff that looked like watercolor. So I yeah. painted also on canvas and on watercolor paper um, graffiti pieces and sketches. And then I took them on the wall and checked if I can yeah. reproduce the effect. Then I tried some stuff with like transparent paints. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to the studio and then tried to do something with that. So it was like a back and forth. Yeah, I mean, like street her, her book title yeah. is like from street to canvas. But what yeah. she actually did is she came from street to canvas. Mm -hmm. And then she took what she had on the canvas back into the street. Exactly. So it's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I can, like, there, this is, like, already a very distinctive style. You can see the layers and the transparency of the letters. And if you want to become a successful artist, you have to develop your own style. Yes. And so how do you do that? Just by practicing, like, by mm -hmm. trying, like, by painting, 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 right? Exactly. It was a couple of years trying stuff, destroying things, being frustrated. I think every artist knows that, you know? Yeah. But for me, the, the main intention I had uh, was to put this energy of painting in the street on a canvas. Yeah. And when you, you, like, you put a graffiti piece on a canvas, it looks like a sticker. It loses the energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that, and I was frustrated about that. Yeah. So then that's why I used the movement of the letters and the energy of how you paint. Because when you paint, you use your whole body. And that's what I used in the end on canvas, and that's how my style um, yeah. evolved. So it, there mean, is a lot of graffiti. Yeah, we in talked it. about that many mm -hmm. times actually right. about artists that try to. But they can't. They're used to painting like this on a, with a, and then they try to put it on a canvas and they start doing this, and it loses that yeah. energy. So yes. you have successfully figured that out. Yeah, that but uh, there are quite a few artists that never figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So. so, I mean, like developing your own style. Marty, you have your own style too. Like, was yours? <laughs> I mean, when I see photos, then I know this is a Martha Cooper photo. So, did you like make a conscious decision how you would want to approach photography, or no? Did it just happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would not say a conscious decision. No? But I mean, I definitely am selective about what I shoot and how I shoot it. Yeah. And, you know, as you, you say, you could recognize, I guess I recognize a situation when I see it that works for me yeah. for whatever 
Is well, I see, you know, you mm -hmm. are, when I see your photos, you're close to the people. You're mostly close to the people. They're not shooting right. with a long lens. I usually like use a wide angle rather yes. than a long lens. And you make contact to your subjects mm -hmm. and you're like shooting yeah. like like documentary style, but you're mm -hmm. very close. Like she's always saying that my photos are too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Because I use too much flesh. I, I, you know what? I actually, I don't like to, at least for me, see the presence of the photographer in the finished photo. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to see, oh, it's a low angle or a high angle or a distorted angle or, uh, or they made a special effort to put this in the foreground. Or to, and, and so I'm not very good at landscapes, for example. I'm not good at pretty pictures. And I, don't, I mean, and I don't even try to shoot those very yeah. often. I love working yeah. with her because we can do projects together because we do yeah. have a different style. So mm -hmm. it, it, our styles it, work well. Our styles work you know. together very well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I lost my. Da, 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 da. Wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 wait, I wanted to show more pictures. Yes, more. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at more pictures about the, look at that. So that was one where you definitely brought it from the canvas back to the street, right? Yes, so exactly. Here you can still recognize the letters also, but you can really see already that it's like, there are no outlines anymore, there's yeah. just the letter movement, yeah. um, all the transparencies, not hiding anything, because that's also typical of Fiddy, like, you're doing a fill-in and you might fade over and then you do an outline at a 3D and you cover everything with it, yeah. you know, and then it looks super crisp and clean. So I actually broke that rule too because you see everything. Every yeah. shading shines through, so yeah. everything is in layers. Yeah. I mean, I saw some, I read about, I mean, read this book. Like, I'm not going to tell you everything that's in <laughs> it, but it's a very interesting <laughs> book to read about your story. Like. Like that you're like when you're in your studio, you have like different canvases and you put a layer here and then you put mm -hmm. a layer there and you like, I mean like every layer is visible. That's, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's your style. This is in Chicago, Chicago. right? That's 2018. Yeah. yeah. And there you're painting. I put this in to like look at the, look where she is painting right now because now you have a better understanding of the scale of the wall because <laughs> it's a big wall. Yeah. And then we have this. Yeah, this was in Saarbrücken, it's in Germany. Yeah. That was quite funny because it's in a, as you see, in a very old environment. Yeah. You know, like yeah. uh, there's a castle, classical. very classic everything. Um, and usually my work, because it's abstract, people just accept it more or less everywhere where it is. But in this case, people were really, like, there were some really angry people. Yeah. Because they felt it didn't, didn't fit into this kind of like, uh, old setting, you know, like because all the buildings were like 100 to 500 years old and then suddenly something so modern in between. So they even had uh, people writing letters to the, what is that called, Denkmalschutz? Denkmalschutz. What um, is that in English? God, what's the English I word for Denkmalschutz? Cultural yeah. Heritage Protection. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and complaining about my work and everything, yes. but of course they knew about the project. So they, yeah. they, but it was like all over the media and the region there. Um, and uh, there was a very, very dear old man. He was uh, uh, about 90 years yeah. old and he wrote a letter, a public letter that he doesn't understand why the people are so narrow-minded and he loves it and it was Aww. very cute. But I never thought that an abstract piece could, you know, rise so many emotions and people and so many, you know. Yeah, I mean, fighting. we had one piece here in Berlin yeah. that we had trouble with mm -hmm. that the people living there did not like at all, but they misinterpreted it and it was not abstract. So that okay. made, but yeah, how can you be angry at an abstract painting? Yeah, it was <laughs> quite, quite an experience too. Yeah. yeah, and I think the contrast is beautiful yeah. with the old yeah, sculpture in the front and the abstract yeah. painting. Is it still there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So oh, good. you won. <laughs> yes, I won. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, that looks quite big too. Where's yes, that? That was my highest. That's like uh, 55 meters high. Mm -hmm. And that's in Jersey City. So in the background, you see Manhattan. Yeah. And I had to paint it with a swing stage. It was the first time I used the swing stage. So the stage was on top and then you go down. Yeah. Oh, it's like, you know, on, on, on yes. ropes and stuff? Ooh. Yes. And I, I'm a bit scared of heights. And this 
was just, <laughs> the, I remember the first night because the guys, they were priming it from the company and I was like, okay, then I can see if the lift breaks down or not. Okay, it yeah, didn't. So, <laughs> and then I went up there, it was terrible, honestly. And the first night there, I dreamt of falling the whole night. So oh, I was wow. working up like, oh my God. But I went up there, um, we were three and it was really rewarding because the first day we were up there, I saw the sun rise over Manhattan. Wow. It was at six in the morning and all of Manhattan was pink because of all the windows uh, reflecting the sun. And I thought like, wow, okay, this moment alone wasn't, was already enough just to overcome your fear and do this. Um, yeah, and then we worked our way from top to bottom. The, the, the engine broke once, so we had to go down very fast. That was not fun. But um, yeah, we got it done. And that's How the long did thing. it take? Uh, this one was uh, 10 days. Wow, that's fast. Yeah. It was such a big wall. Yeah, I had two people helping me, filling in the big uh, area. So before you did that, did you call Marty to come out and take pictures? No, no. I should have, right? Yeah. Will next you do time that? Will, next will time. you do Sorry. next time? <laughs> <laughs> Never gonna happen again. <laughs> I will look for another wall like this yes, to make sure. Please. <laughs> Where is that? That's in the Maldives. Oh, uh, really I want to be an yes. artist. I want to go to the Maldives. <laughs> <laughs> that was really surreal because when I was painting this, you know, you look into the water that, I mean, the Maldives by itself are surreal, but then there were like these uh, stingrays coming by and then you looked at the fish and it was just like, wow, what am I doing here? Um, yeah, so this is also still there. So, so you can go visit it. Let's go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was like several of those houses that you painted, right? Was yes. it like a hotel? So or this is yes, because in the Maldives, every island is like one hotel, yeah. or one resort. So ah, okay. I, this is the overwater bar. And then I painted the dive center, and then I painted the uh, spa, and they were all over water. So. Nice. Very nice, but it was also very hot, so in between I, I always bet. had to jump into the water to cool oh, down. Oh, you poor thing. I, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> terrible to work like this, I know. <laughs> so this is 2020, that looks yeah. really, really high. That is Abu Dhabi, that was is my highest to date, and it's also the highest in the UAE um, to date. Um, and we also had three swing stages, and the special thing about this project was I had a team of 10 people because you need uh, somebody to operate the, the swing stages with. So there always have to be at least two people on the swing stage to operate the mm -hmm. engines. And uh, we were from seven different nations. Oh, wow. And that was fantastic. We had Sweden, the US, Dominican Republic, uh, Pakistan, India. And it was so fantastic. We all used English language because yeah. you know everybody spoke a different language. We had different religions. We had Muslims who didn't want to paint on uh, Fridays, but we managed to you know convince them that it's okay to paint on Fridays. <laughs> you lied. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was like the whole situation was really beautiful because I thought like we are so different. We are from so many different countries, and we all come together, and we really f fought hard to finish this wall because we had to fight with the wind with some people over there and everybody just wanted it to be finished. And it's hot. Yes, and it was hot. And I was just so grateful also to all these people who were basically yeah. fighting for my art, you know? So is, did you, is that when you started like to have people assisting you in the painting? Yes, when they got really big, because yeah. the, the problem is always, you always have a contractor to a certain degree or a festival. So you have a limited amount of time yeah. available because these lifts cost a lot of money and then you have to be really efficient. Yeah. And that's when it really makes sense to have people who just fill in big yeah. blocks of And paint. like all the, the, the transparent layers where yes. they get on top of each other, you do that exactly. and you just give the fill-ins to yeah. some of the people I do because all the it's teachers. too big. You can't yeah, you can yeah. do that by yourself. Is it anymore. always just spray can? No, uh, with this wall also I used a lot of uh, emulsion. So mm -hmm. now I'm using also big paint guns. Mm -hmm. So I also switch tools and mm -hmm. learn to use different tools because it uh, doesn't make sense anymore with right. a spray can. I only use spray cans now for the details. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you ever experience that spray cans and the other paint have different times of fading? Yes. 
Because <laughs> I've seen that at some walls, and then you can really tell where they use mm -hmm. the spray cane uh, can, and yes. it's more b bleached on the other side. So yeah. it is a risk to use. It is a risk, media. definitely, um, but you can avoid it by uh, putting a layer of UV protection. There she goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I would say is, of course, the photograph becomes a record, yeah. and then you get the photograph when it's fresh, and then we don't care if it fades. Yeah. You know, then it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, because the photograph is the photograph almost always lasts longer. Yeah, absolutely. Than the actual wall. Yeah, that's, Which that's part of the good. game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually like for the 700 wall. It, it's in really bad shape now, but I don't mind because mm -hmm. I have the photo. Yeah. And I mean, See? what you did is like you documented the whole. Um, time of graffiti and I mean nowadays everybody has a phone and they can take a picture but back in the days right, that was not the case mm -hmm. you know and if we hadn't have people like you we had lost the whole history you know well thank you so but I mean I was aware of that when I was shooting and I was thinking yeah um, I was actually thinking I'm gonna have these pictures it's gonna I thought graffiti would disappear completely and I would have the exclusive <laughs> photos. I never thought we would. I didn't actually see it as traveling around the world. Yeah. I thought it was a specifically New York City phenomenon. I would have these pictures. And I actually was hoping that nobody else would take them. And then, you know, they would be like trophies. Yeah. But I was completely wrong about my projection. <laughs> <laughs> it went around yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. So now we come to the galleries. <laughs> so you made the translation. I mean, I read about in your book that you actually you were offered uh, the position of an art director in London. Mm -hmm. And then you decided you wanted to figure out your art and you went and rented a gallery and started working as a waitress. Yes. So you could have time to just discover your own art. And you tried a lot and you burned a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that true? Tell yes. us a little bit about that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so after I finished studying, I was offered this position in London. And um, they gave me one week to decide what I want to do. And so I was traveling around London in the bus, thinking, thinking. And I thought, if I accept this art director job in London, it's very prestigious, it's well paid but I will never have the time to rent a studio, or if I can rent it, I will not have time to spend there because I have to afford the rent in London. <laughs> um, and then I thought like, I will never really try with art. So, because when you have a certain standard of living, it's very yeah. difficult to go back. You need a lot of character to do that. And yeah. I thought like, well, I'm not sure if I can manage. So in this time, I, I decided I um, reject the offer. So I went back to Germany, got a very cheap studio in, in my area for like 100 euros a month mm -hmm. and uh, worked as a waitress because I also didn't want to go like the middle road, you know, to do a little bit something creative. I just wanted to focus on really figuring out my own style and where I wanted to go. So I worked as a waitress for about one year and then step by step uh, things were picking up. I got offered the first exhibitions and yeah, then it worked out. Yeah, yep, it worked out. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was in London last year. I mean, year. this is like one of her beautiful paintings. Like you can see every single layer in there. And she's mm -hmm. doing pink now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so this one is the one of the biggest I've ever painted. This is four meter fifty uh -huh. wide and two meters high. And it was interesting because I also had to figure out how to do brush strokes that size. So I had to walk on the painting because you cannot do it like on the wall. So again, I had to find a technique to actually achieve this uh, effect. Um, yes, and I used. Will you bing. tell us the technique, or of is course it not? It's <laughs> 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 worth a try. <laughs> but maybe you come visit me in the studio one yes, day. Yes, we will. Then. We will yes. definitely. <laughs> it's definitely in the box. Yeah. And um, shit, I just had something I dropped. I said shit on live 
<laughs> well, we are not in the U.S. <laughs> I think in Germany. Oh, I just, you know what I remembered? I wanted to add the photo to the PowerPoint presentation that you took of her when she was at our festival here in Berlin in 2008, and I forgot. Oh, you didn't put it in there? No, I forgot. I'm an idiot. Because yeah. in 2008, we organized a big festival for women in hip-hop mm -hmm. called We Be Girls here in Berlin for one month. And uh, Claudia was actually there and it's painted a beautiful wall, and Martha took a picture. Picture, but you know, I didn't know I had that picture. No, she reminded me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I totally forgot. I didn't even know that I had ever met you before. Yes, so. we've <laughs> met just once, and I mean, come on, it's uh, 14 years ago. So yeah, and I had forgotten that completely. So yeah. this, and this I, I wanted to add this beautiful picture, but I'm an idiot, and yeah, so okay. that <laughs> happens. You know, Whatever. ADHD. Don't worry, move on. <laughs> There is one more. Look beautiful. at that. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful right? Beautiful. And you have such a distinctive style. Like it's like yeah. when you see a house and it has Metsy on it, you know that it's Metsy. It's very distinctive yeah. Yeah, style. For sure. Thank you. And lots of pink. Yes. <laughs> now, it's, uh, it's actually rare to find a canvas by, done by me that has no pink. Oh, good. So <laughs> <laughs> I, like in the beginning, it was also a statement yeah. because of that, you know. Well, and I also have my own color, Matsy Psycho Pink, so yeah. You have your own color? Yes. Mm -hmm. Martha also has her own color. I, I know. Color. Martha Marie. Martha Marie. Martha Marie. And yeah. you know it goes really well with Matt's Eve Psycho Pink. Oh, we it's should a do a really good combination. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those guys are going to paint a canvas together and yes. um, yeah. we're going to sell it to the highest bidder. We yeah. are painting a canvas no, and we're going to make the wall. an NFT. We're going to oh, yes. make an <laughs> NFT of <laughs> course. <laughs> you want to show them the hand sign? No. <laughs> We made you a hand should. sign. You should. We you made should. a hand sign for the NFT. Yes. Should I? Yes. But well, you have to do it with me. Um, I can't remember. When it was like N yes. F T. F <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. Live stream. <laughs> so censored. Now we come to like how Marty experienced the street to canvas in the 80s in New York. Yeah, and I picked these pictures out specifically because yeah, we yeah. were talking about that. And I would say that one of the things that most attracted me to start photographing was the idea, when I met this boy, that he was designing pieces in a notebook to put on a wall. That he was first making little sketches. Because until that point, I just thought the graffiti that I was seeing was random vandalism. And I hadn't really looked at it. It didn't really occur to me that you could identify uh, the person who had done it. I didn't understand that it was a name. And he, he explained, and his name was also he, he three, that, and you can see he, he, that he had this little notebook and that he was sketching and practicing to put his name on a wall. And that idea was what intrigued me enough to start photographing this. And then he introduced me to Dandi. So then I was completely hooked. <laughs> anyway, so we keep going, Nika. Yes, ma'am. You know, I just picked out a few pictures um, that I thought here. This was an afternoon where Dandi and his friends were designing in their black books. Um, keep going. We're, we're going <laughs> to. But, but you can see, I mean, I don't think people who know nothing about, people who know about graffiti know about black books, of course. Yeah, yeah. But people who don't, I, I don't think they understand that it's often a design that's gone from paper to wall. Yeah. Um, it's, okay, it's not a canvas, but it is paper. So that's Zephyr and Revolt, Billy. These are just examples. So I met Blade, and Blade, at the time, there were a few little galleries that were showing graffiti, and he told me that he wanted to paint on a canvas. So we went to an art store. This is Blade's car, and I bought a canvas for him. And he's putting the canvas that I bought, it was $50, which was a lot for me at the time, in his car. And this is Blade painting his first canvas, which is now in a museum in Holland, actually. The Groninger Museum owns this canvas. <laughs> and um, you can see his friends are sitting around watching. And this was the f his first attempt. Yeah, and you're still good friends, and he still paints canvases for yes, you, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, 
to this day. So, but, but I just think it's interesting because what date do we, 1982, you were born in 1980, see, yes. here we have, and so there were graffiti writers uh, trying to paint some more successful than others on canvas uh, for quite a while. Okay, we can just flip through a few. Um, this is Dandy, um, and this was in a studio set up by uh, an art collector named Sam Essies, who bought canvas, stretched canvas, invited graffiti, got the spray paint, and invited, hired, and, and rented a studio as well, and got these uh, actually very well-known graffiti writers, uh, Zephyr, Dandi, Futura, uh, to come and paint canvases. And these canvases were always supposed to be, he said, kept as a set. Unfortunately, so did, did he pay them or did he just buy he the canvases? Not pay them. He did not pay he them. He did not pay them. Okay. So this has become a real bone of contention. And yeah. you can read about it on Zephyr's website yeah. at length. Um, it unfortunately, was supposed to be a document of history and kept together. And, yes, uh, And exactly. then the guy... Yes, well, he died. Yes. Uh, his daughter inherited this group of paintings and they have, I don't think anybody actually knows where they are exactly, but there's been a lot of talk about it um, well, over waiting. the Joe years. Well, and all those guys Every, are dead and then they're going to sell yeah, them. <laughs> but but this, this studio was set up by uh, an art collector. However, there were other studios, and I think I have a picture in here. Uh, this was Soul Artists, and th this is Lady Pink, Dandi and Futura, and that's Pink's sister. Um, and they had a studio themselves, on, on the Upper West Side, actually, not far from where I live. And they got their canvases together. So one of the things that had attracted me about graffiti was the idea that it couldn't be sold and that the artists were doing it for each other and for themselves, and to me this was a form of pure art. <laughs> so, um, but it turns out that they actually did want to sell it, but they, of course they couldn't sell what they were putting on the trains. And, the yeah. only, and, and New York City has so many galleries, I mean, art, canvas, it, you know. So that it, was the time that it really went into the galleries, right? Graffiti, how, is, how long did just, that last? You know, look at this, this is 81, that yeah. was, it's not actually in chronological order because the other one was 82. Um, did that last for a while or was it like, did that burn out after a few years or how did that go? Uh, well, this, this didn't last for very long, but mm -hmm. you know, then keep going. I mean, there were more, other ones cropped up. I mean, this was uh, GPI, Graffiti Productions, what year are we, 82 here? And here, Lady Pink was there, you see, and that's Freedom, he's still active. Um, yes. Tracy. Tracy one sixty eight yeah, I mean, is the yeah, Wiz is in the, the back. Ernie. Yeah. Um, a lot of these guys are still painting. And GPI also uh, provided a space and, and the paint and the canvas. And the idea was to sell the work. And this is Nock. And Nock is out there. Nock is still painting. And Nock did the famous Star Wars train oh, okay. uh, that Henry took the title Star Wars from. So I just wanted to show that the idea of graffiti writers painting on canvas wasn't a new idea. Crash, same thing. Okay, we can just flip through some of these. Just, this is Pink's first canvas um, that she painted. Did Ken have yeah. a print of that at the last show or was it the original? Did whoever at print? At the Miami Graffiti Museum. I think I saw a print there, of the canvas, but I'm not sure if I it was the, maybe it was the original. Is. Maybe, maybe she gave yes, him the, the original. original. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, keep going. So of course, Lady Pink was one of the first female graffiti writers in New York. The, uh, maybe the first that really uh, kept at it and became yeah. known. There were others that jumped in and out, but she's still going, um, and she's still going. These are later, 2004. Yep. Uh, that one, weren't you there with me when she painted that in, in Minneapolis? Yep, yep, I was there, um, you're right. When we went to B Girl B, we went to an all-female uh, hip-hop hip event. Festival, yeah, which then and inspired us to do the one in Berlin. Yeah, mm-hmm. And Pink is still painting, yep. yep. And this is a, another gallery that's sharp. Um, you can see it's in the window. 
So these are this just all again examples of how um, writing, and some more successful than others. I think Sharp does a pretty good job on Canvas, but he still stuck to the classic letter style. Yeah. Um, and Hayes, Hayes is very active. Okay, keep going. Just yeah. Okay. And here, this was this is an early show that Futura organized, and he showed the tools of graffiti at this show. And if you look, this was the poster for the show, and Keith Haring is on this poster, Basquiat is on this poster, I'm on this poster, <laughs> Futura is on the, Kenny Scharf. I mean, this is, this is really, a, I think, Lady so Pink. So what, Futura Lady Pink. organized that? Futura organized that show, oh, cool. yes, and invited me to be in it. It was called Beyond Words, words being the graffiti, because graffiti is letters. Okay, keep going. At Say, Say is a well-known uh, designer now, the Def Jam, I think he works in various other places, but here he is, and here we have is on the train and on canvas. Yeah, and directly yeah. translated yeah, the yes, same not, thing. Not trying to do anything different, yeah. different yeah. than yeah. what he would put. Okay, keep going. I, and Fashion Moto was a gallery in the Bronx, and Crash did the exterior. Here, again, they showed a lot of uh, graffiti, and this was Futura, this is the Fun Gallery, Patty Astor and uh, Futura's show at the Fun Gallery. So the idea of putting graffiti on canvas, and it started it in, was in, in, I'd say 79, because I have a catalog from Italy from 79 that has some canvases in it. Again, this is Patty Astor's graffiti show at the Fun Gallery all on canvas, and Futura. Yeah, yeah, Oops. that's it. That's it, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, that was Patty, key. This is Patty, Dondi, Oh yeah, this is Dondi at the Fun Gallery. Dondi's painting's now selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So. And didn't Keith Herring like paint the whole gallery, including Patty's yes. jacket yes. and the telephone? Yes, that's Keith signing, Keith signing for these yeah. kids. He's signing their books for them. So, so it was in the a, galleries. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, canvas to, I mean, we've got walls to canvas to wall, as you said before, back and forth, really. So, and there's can, uh, like graffiti in books. I mean, you made like one of the first books about graffiti and it traveled the world, the subway art, and inspired a lot of young people. You have made several books, you have made several books, and now we have the internet. Yes. <laughs> we have the right. internet. I, I want to say one thing about the books. Yeah. One of the reasons why Henry Chalfon and I combined our work in Subway Art That's was true, because yeah. we said to each other, there can only be one book about graffiti, and if, if we <laughs> each try to make a book, we're never going to be able to do this, that the publishers would never go for more than one book about graffiti. So we <laughs> combined them into this one book, which was, the original book was only 96 pages. It's really, and paperback. I mean, and that was all, we, we proposed it to many, many publishers, and it got rejected right and left. And of course, now there are thousands. There, I'm, I'm, I think there are thousands of books. Yeah, I, mean, I don't how think many that's books, an exaggeration. How many books did you donate to the library? <laughs> <laughs> many boxes of books. <laughs> that, because I feel like this is a, a huge art movement and that some people are still not taking it seriously enough. And that what's in those books are going to be what's, as we were saying, the photographs are what's left of these walls because most of the, the work is ephemeral and it doesn't last, and I wanted to see it in one place, and thank you, Urban Nation, for providing that space. Amen. Because, you know, really, si yep. sincere thanks. It's a beautiful library, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm very happy with the library, and um, we're, gonna, we're continuing to collect, if anybody has anything they want to donate, please. And yes. we're not just books, but zines, and we're looking at uh, PhD dissertations that we're downloading PDFs, and we, we want to really make it a serious research center. So yeah, if you know about any books that are out there that are not in the library, just mm -hmm. contact any of us, and or go to the Urban website. Do we have our librarian here? Do we have our librarian, librarian here? <laughs>
was here earlier. She was here. She left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> gonna have Let's Evelyn. Make more Is work Evelyn for here? Her. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, in the beginning, Martha tried to like purchase every book that had to do with graffiti and street art, and it's, it's impossible. impossible because there's yes. so many publications out there. Right. And, um, but this is one you really need. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, books still do make sense. In these days, you think like it's still a good, like do people still buy books? Apparently, yes. <laughs> they still publish them. I, I guess they do still buy them. Mm -hmm. They're very heavy, you know. Yeah. Um, to, so then the shipping becomes a bit of a problem. Um, but I, I personally like books, you know, not to have to use a battery to look at a picture. I, <laughs> you, know, you can leaf through a book in a different way, but yeah. then, you know, I'm old school. I'm, a, I'm an elder. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know whether, we don't know. I mean, you, you have made quite some books as well. Mm -hmm. Not like Martha, because Martha has like made many more books than we ever will, but... Um, you also made like collaborations in books, right? You invited yeah. other artists. Yes. What was one of those books? Uh, the first one was uh, called Sticker City. It was about the sticker and poster movement. She made a book about that too. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> second one was uh, see, Street I don't Fault. know that book. I want to see. Yeah, that there were only there was only a small edition actually. Of well, the are there library, still some available for the library? We'll make uh, one yes. available for <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the second one was uh, street fonts. That was about alphabets. Yeah. Because for me, it me that you always have to explain people who are not into graffiti, as mm. Martha once yeah. was, yeah. Uh, but it's about letters and right. how to read it and how to see the, how versatile it is. So for me, it was very important to give people kind of like a key to understand graffiti and to appreciate it, you know, and not just say like, oh, this is just scribbled, that you understand the different styles. So I thought like, okay, how can you tell that to somebody? So I want to make sure that you have the same 26 letters and you can flip the pages and compare it. And then you can really understand this A looks like this, this is like this, and then you see the flow and all the ideas. So you had different letters do the alphabet. Yeah. Which then of course for some of the graffiti writers is hard because they keep painting the same letters, right? Yeah. It was <laughs> very different. Some of them who said like, no, I don't think I can do I, it. I can't do a W. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually uh, an issue for some, yes. And then the, the third one was about, um, it's called Mural XSL, and it was about the large-scale murals. So basically because I travel the world, uh, of course, differently than Martha, but I also um, kind of like observed what was new, at least new to me. It was a new movement, so first it was the stickers and posters that I saw also mainly in New York. I remember Swoon mm. uh, with her amazing cutouts and, and, and um, refs who, who did these like sculptures refs, and posters right. and everything. That was different to what I usually saw um, than the alphabets and then also the murals. I think it is really a movement that started after like 2000, 2010. I think it really blew up in in the uh, last 10 years yeah. uh, and people got became like the murals became bigger and bigger and also um, there was a much wider market for that you know people got invited not just by festivals but also by um, the owners of the buildings and so on so that was also a new movement for me <laughs> so yeah you made lots of collaborations and now you made this Yes. What was why? What made you do this? <laughs> uh, actually, in the last ten years, I had a couple of requests from publishers to do a book about my work. But I always it's strange. I feel too young. I don't feel I'm ready for that. Um, and then at some point, I felt like, well, I've done so much. It was like 25 years that I thought, like, okay, let's see what I, how I evolved. And I also felt like I have my own style now. I have my personal um, signature in a way. Um, and I kind of like felt ready, but then it was the topic about finding time to go through 25 years of your work. Yeah. And then COVID came. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you and, had time. <laughs> and I had time <laughs> to finally go through all these um, pictures, also like the paper pictures that I still had, like because 
So, but you look like an organized person, so it wasn't that, that hard to go through your work, right? Yes, but there are more fun things that you can do, that's why yeah, I try to avoid yeah. it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I always f feel like going backwards, going through your work is going backwards in a True. way. Yeah. You know, and I always like to keep going forwards, so. Yeah. I have no so. idea how you do this with, like, all the pictures you've ever taken. I mean, yes, I've taken, I'm like, one or two from the old pieces, but, I mean, I have no idea where you even would start. <sighs> it's not real. Mm. Come visit me in my studio and I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> How many weeks do I have to yeah, <laughs> schedule right. for this with it? <laughs> Just, I have drawers full of things. Mostly yeah. they're slides. Ah. The old ones are, yeah. you know, and they're in files. Why do we have a beeping <laughs> all of a sudden? <laughs> So, I mean, like you said, yeah, then you have to go back through all this stuff and like, and we also know that you come back home and you shot like thousands of photos and then you have to put them on your computer and you have yeah. to edit them and you have to label them and then, and then, and So how do you motivate yourself? Like this is for me, like I think a lot of people that, like a lot of my friends that have like regular work, you know, nine to five jobs, they don't understand how hard it is when you are working by yourself in your apartment or your studio to motivate yourself to do especially all the shit that you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to take photos, but do I want to like go through them and label them and put keywords and blah, blah, blah. But then like, how do you motivate yourself? Who wants to start? Well, I will say that I put the things that I don't want to, I make a list and I put the thing that I don't want to do at the top of the list. Like in, in the morning or what? I, yes, I try to get it over with because then I can pat myself That's good. on the back <laughs> and say, I've done it. You know, it gives me a kind of impetus to get through the rest of the day. I really, I put, if there's something, especially if I notice that I've been avoiding it, it goes right to the top of the list. It's like, let's get that thing over with. And uh, that kind of works for me. And then you get That's points, awesome. right? Well, yes, I have this point system <laughs> <laughs> for myself, and I try to do three points a day. <laughs> they, and that, I mean, it, certain emails are only worth half a point, like sending emails to somebody, but like the hard things are worth a point, and I try to do three hard things a day. That's an amazing Yeah, technique. I mean, I'm switching to her system. I, yeah. We talked about that yesterday. I told <laughs> I her about have my a list. I, make, I definitely, yeah. you know, I do list. have lists too, but then, yeah. you know, there's yeah. like 50 things on that yes. fucking list. Yes. <laughs> and then I look at it and then I go back to bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I make list of lists and yeah, trying to separate it. No, but uh, that's definitely tough for me. It's hard to separate being creative and um, like email works. Like that's the worst. So if yeah. whoever wrote me emails before, they know that I'm terrible at replying just because I also try to avoid it because it takes away my focus. So uh, what I do is I put a day, days in the week where I only do computer work and then other days where I paint. Mm -hmm. I cannot combine okay. both or if I really have to, then I do it the same as Martha, like I do the, the emails in the morning because I hate doing it. Mm. And then I have a lunch break and then I paint. So I, I try to kind of like separate it. But um, I don't really have to motivate myself for like the actual painting. I think that's probably the same for you. Taking yeah. pictures is fun. But everything around it that nobody sees, that's the annoying part. And that's where it sometimes is hard. Yeah. How many hours do you dedicate to painting? like a week or a day or totally depends it depends totally like uh i remember I, in december and january i didn't want to paint and then i was like on a painting frenzy and i painted like 30 canvases uh in in a month but uh it really depends like it really depends on the mood now in march i didn't feel like painting at all i didn't paint one canvas so it really depends hmm. yeah so that's the good thing about you know being a artist you can choose usually how you work. Yeah. So I think we should ask for questions. I think we mm -hmm. should ask for questions. Mm -hmm. I'm like through the points that I wanted to talk about. Or if you have anything else you want to share with the audience that I forgot to ask you. No. No. <laughs> Let's get off of here and have a glass of wine, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think questions. So you know, can we start? Up. I know we planned the question section a little bit later, but could we already start this now? Is that okay Why for you it? guys? Or am I bringing like total chaos yeah. to the 
Yes, he's nodding. I'm uh, totally chaos here. Really? That was <laughs> not the plan. But <laughs> well, we're supposed to keep we're supposed to keep going with this. I think we've said everything. <laughs> yeah, we've said everything, and now yeah. we want to hear what people want to know. Yeah. Any questions? None, because because we said so much. Oh no, there's like somebody had a <laughs> no, question. No, there's somebody up there who has a question. Oh, hi, James. Hi. Can hardly see you. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Martha, my question. You know, I don't really know. I, all I know is that I didn't buy anything and I regret it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ram LZ had some very nice pieces in there that, you know, the, the, there were some uh, people who were really thinking ahead. I, what I think is that there were a few avid collectors that pretty much bought nearly everything that the galleries came up with. And you know, they had money, they had space to store it, and they were smart. But I don't think, I don't think there was a wide interest in buying these, in, in buying canvases. But I, I do think there were a few hardcore collectors. To be, the best of my knowledge. I don't really know. That's the real answer. I remember Crash and Lady Pink, they told me that um, in the beginning of the 80s, there was like this big hype where a lot of galleries showed mm -hmm. their work. And I remember yeah. Pink telling me that they went to Japan for a big mm -hmm. show and yep. uh, they were all doing really well. And then suddenly, I think in the middle of the 80s to the 90s, there was really like this mm -hmm. drop of interest. Um, I think it was Futura also who worked as a bike messenger and, mm -hmm. and yep. stuff. Yep. So where where nobody sold anything anymore, mm -hmm. um, and there were just a few people who sold a little bit and just got by. I think Crash did mm -hmm. well still, like he managed. Um, but then it started picking up. I think in the end of the nineties, like. See, um, Mad knows more. <laughs> you do. Well, it's just yeah. like talking yeah. to people uh, yeah. from the past. So no, I'm, I think that's right. I think that's right. You know, but I, I think, think I've heard the same. Mm. So let's see how it goes this time. <laughs> yeah. That's. Any questions? There is a question over there. I think they want you to walk to the microphone. Where is the mi <laughs> <laughs> The microphone is over there. <laughs> Thanks, uh, first of all, for taking the time to come here today. It's a great uh, pleasure. Well, uh, Metsi, I would like to ask you, what is the significance to you, uh, painting at night uh, and uh, transitioning to the canvas? Uh, what is the difference? How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. And uh, from the photographer's perspective to Martha, what is to you the significance of having it on the canvas versus the real picture of it? Uh, it's a similar <coughs> thing, maybe, in essence, um, from the different perspectives. So, yeah, how do you feel emotionally about the two results? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you answer first? <laughs> okay. Um, I think you have to uh, kind of like try to do all the different things graffiti <coughs> offers. So I remember I had like one year where I only painted at night. It was really extreme. So I just painted silver and, and, and black. Um, and I realized then that it was so much fun that I had no energy anymore <coughs> to put a lot of time into a piece. So that, and on the other hand, annoyed me also a little bit because I knew I still have a lot to learn. So I kind of like forced myself to <coughs> go back on the wall and do something that is a bit more complex again. Um, but also I think it's very important that I had this uh, time where I also painted at night because it's a different energy still <laughs> it still is a different energy you know like the speed you you're doing like the adrenaline rush everything um, and I think you cannot paint uh, a canvas that's really honest and energetic if you haven't ever felt that so and I still think if, if graffiti would only be on a canvas or on legal wall I wouldn't like it either you know so I still look at the pieces that I see, I still appreciate it. I still think about the, the effort, you know, when I see a piece that's high up, I always think like subconsciously, okay, how did they get up there? 
like, what did they do? Ah, they, this is the way they went and stuff, you know? And I enjoy that very much because every piece tells a story, no matter how quick it was done. Yeah. Well, I would just say as a photographer, I'm, I'm really way more interested in documenting the illegal work than the legal work. Yeah. Um, the idea that people go out at night and paint a train is <laughs> very exciting to me. And, and getting to go along, it's like a, uh, you know, it's like I've been let into a secret world, and I really appreciate the crews and the writers that have allowed me to photograph them. But I've also photographed the canvases and the galleries when I could because I thought it was very, as a documentary photographer, I wanted to get the whole picture. And I'm, even though I don't think these pictures of galleries are particularly interesting, um, as examples of what was happening at the time. Some of these pictures are the only examples of those shows because people weren't photographing them at the time. People didn't have cell phones and I was shooting 64 ISO Kodachrome slides. You know, it was not easy to take pictures inside. I'm glad that I have those pictures, but they, there's no comparison about the interests I have in taking them, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're just, they're, they're like the extra um, things that are, are along the outside of the main event. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Part mm -hmm. of the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. part of the game. And I mean, it is interesting to see this. I mean, this is, to me, this, this particular picture, for example, the, the fact that Keith is, Keith Haring, who became so incredibly famous, is, had, decorated Patty's studio and had painted her jacket. I don't think there's another picture. I've never seen anybody else with this picture. I mean, it's, it's historic, so I'm happy that I have it. But I didn't get the same thrill in taking it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, looking back, you're happy that you got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and you, when you were photographing that back in the day, a lot of the times you were the only one around with a camera, right? Yeah. Exactly. And now I'm a photographer. She made me a photographer, by the way. She <laughs> gave like 12 years ago or 14 years ago, she gave me a camera and said, go be a photographer. <laughs> so I did that. But now everybody has an iPhone 13 and... Mm -hmm. Though I will say, I don't know what... <laughs> Nika, can, can you flip to that picture of Dandi in his studio? Photography was always important to graffiti writers. It was That one? No, in the way, the first, it was way in the beginning. Yep. Go in the other direction. Um, the one where, yeah. The, this is Dandi's photo album. Those are pictures that he took himself with a cardboard camera, uh, which he got the same way he got his paint, free. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And just, you know, a little uh, disposable camera. But he told me that he didn't paint a train unless he, he had a camera. Uh, oh. the, the, he, they, and this was one of the reasons that I was able to connect with writers because I could take pictures and give them to them and my pictures were generally better because I had better equipment. But photography was always uh, important to graffiti writers as proof of what they had done because often their, their pieces only lasted one day and they got uh, buffed or painted over immediately. So. Um, I wasn't the only one taking pictures. Yeah. More questions? More? Oh yes, there is somebody there. Um, I got a question for Martha. You're still taking a lot of pictures at um, festivals these days, and I'm just curious how you actually organize your day, because there's so much going on all the time. <laughs> how do you decide where to go, what to photograph, like how, what is your secret? You mean at a festival? Y if yeah, I'm at, at a, a festival. festival. Well, usually there's a list of artists. <laughs> and um, so I want to do all the artists. But then maybe some artists are more interesting to me than others. Um, you know, I just, I make the rounds. And if, if the walls are far apart, I ask the organizer of the festival to get me a driver to take me around. And um, it's also, it, you might think it's easy to take a picture of a wall, but often the light is wrong, for example. and you might, it might be strongly backlit, and, or it might have a, a line of a shadow directly across the wall. 
and I don't use a drone, and you had some amazing drone pictures. Nika is a whiz with her drone, so. Well, I crash it all the time. But yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I've seen her crash it, but even so. Um, you know, so I, I just, uh, often I, I might have a map of the walls, and I might actually think about w what direction the light is coming from. And then there, of course, there are things like cars and trucks that get in front of the wall and block the wall, and, uh, and I want to get there where, where, when the artist is actually painting, because I, I like to take the pictures of walls in process. Um, as you might look at the artists at work, hallway we have here, and they're all pictures of artists working. I don't just want to get the finished wall. So I might ask the artist, because I don't want to drive 10 miles and find out that they're out to lunch. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? Same so thing. Like yeah. I'll go out to Tegel and yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you do have to work. You, you have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. You have, to, you have to kind of make a plan yeah. day by day. And I mean, too, right? I mean, those. It is a, I don't know how many people in the room are street art photographers, but I think we all would say the same thing, right, Jaime? Yes. Um, it takes some planning. Anyone else? Anyone else? Or are we finished? Hello. Um, my name is David. I'm very, very excited to be in the same room with uh, several legends. Um, <laughs> So I, I live in Prague, and Matsy, I think that you've had some experience painting in Prague. As a writer myself, you know, there's a lot of work, uh, uh, and um, I decided to give back and, and open a gallery called Gallery Mega, where I'm promoting emerging artists regardless of age, gender, sexuality, etc. cetera. Um, so my question is for you, Matsy, is, do you actively see yourself as an ambassador for female writers? Mm -hmm. And if you do, I would love to invite you to Prague to mm -hmm. essentially um, chat, advise uh, other female young emerging street artists, because I find that I'm having an incredible problem um, trying to promote uh, young female street artists in the country. I mean, Czech Republic, uh, active racism, active homophobia. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm, I have a lot of work ahead of myself, and if you'd be willing, I'd be honored to essentially uh, um, um, present you there. So question A is, do you see yourself as an active ambassador of uh, uh, you know, female writers? Mm -hmm. Um, I have other about 50 million questions for you both, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and then the second question, if you don't mind, is um, have you ever had any corporations photograph your work, as beautiful as it is, and use it for their uh, you know, commercial without asking for approval? Because I think this is a, a, a very serious issue, not only in the Czech Republic, but around the world. Mm -hmm. Have you had a situation, and is there something that you can advise young uh, street artists how to kind of combat this essentially plagiarism? Yeah. Okay, so for the first question, um I remember in the beginning, also when I was in Prague, uh, the pieces I painted there are painted completely on my own. I wanted to make sure that nobody's there when I painted it, so I figured out where I can paint, where is the Hall of Fame, but I just wanted to go on my, on my own to make sure nobody knows who I am. The same as back in the days where I didn't want anybody to know that I'm a woman. Um, and you know, I mean, I didn't like, uh, think about that actively for a long time. But then step by step when I traveled and people came to me and say like, yeah, you're like an idol for me. That was weird, really, like I didn't see myself as that. But then I realized I also have a responsibility because I, um, like some people look at me like, how do I do things? How do I, you know, approach situations and stuff? Um, and then I reflected more and more. And of course I had um, other female artists who came to me uh, especially also in South America, in Mexico, um, and who also told me that they are having problems and asking me for advice and how they should approach uh, certain situations. Um, and of course, for me, I think it's difficult to give an advice because everybody lives in a totally different environment. Uh, everybody has different um, opportunities. 
And there are some women who ha don't have that many opportunities, you know, you, who don't have the support from families or from friends. I think that's very important, you know. So I think it's very arrogant to tell somebody you have to do it like this and this and then it works out. So uh, you always have to see it in a context. Um, but yes, of course, nowadays, I think the, the best thing you can do is be an example and encourage people to say, like, no matter where you are right now in your career, of course you can make it, you know. Of course, it's hard and there will always be difficult times, but uh, in the end, um, it works out. But what also is important is, for example, people like you who support other artists and female artists. I think it's very important because that's also why I'm sometimes a bit um, reluctant to say, like, you know, men are a problem because <laughs> men in my life helped me be where I am now. You know, there were a lot of open minded men who helped me. Um, and so I try to not categorize, are you a man, are you a woman? I think it really is about support, supporting each other, believing in, in each other. And uh, if you have the chance to help a young artist, then do it. And if you see there is a potential, no matter if it's a woman or a man or whatever color of skin or background, it's important to help if you can help this person. So. That's one thing. Um, what was the second question? It was about uh, plagiarism, corporations ah, yeah. taking. Yes, um, of course, I had these situations before. Um, luckily, it came at a point of my career where I could afford a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, and the, there are gray zones. It depends on where you are. For example, in the US, uh, you can actually have a copyright on your wall. That's not, nothing you can do here in Germany. So everything that's in public space is, a, is part of public space. So of course you can, um, there are limits to what people can do with your work, but still it's public art. But in the US you can actually uh, license your mural. Um, that gives you more opportunities to go against uh, violations of copyright. Um, but yeah, if that happens, the first thing you need to, to, to know is that you are aware of that it happens. And that's where Instagram, Facebook and all these networks help a lot. Because once it happened in London, I didn't know about it because I wasn't in London. I didn't see the advertisement with my work. But people notified me and told me here, you know, like from the street art walks there, your work is being used, did you know? And I didn't know. So that's the first thing. You have to be aware that there is a violation actually happening. And then you have to ideally know where to go um, and find the right lawyer who knows how to do about, like, what to do about it. So, and uh, as you said, like with, especially with young artists, there's usually the problem that a lot of work is done illegally. And then if you go and say, like, this is my copyright, it's very difficult. So I think it can work, but you need a really good lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. As you said, um, graffiti, it's a male-dominated field. So we, to have a talk like this in a space like this, led by three amazing women, I think it's very encouraging for a lot of women everywhere. So thank you for doing this. <laughs> And um, my question is for Marta. Marta. Uh, Marta, you said you really enjoyed to take pictures of, um, of graffiti, illegal graffiti. So can you tell us um, um, the, the weirdest and coolest places that illegal graffiti has took, take you uh, for taking pictures? <laughs> Do you want me to say Peru? If you want. <laughs> <laughs> because this is me, right? And she <laughs> brought me to Peru and took me, but one of the things that I loved about Peru was the place that we went. I think we even had to climb over a wall to get there. But we went to a place where there were amazing pieces in a sort of an abandoned place. That, and I just, these incredibly complex pieces that writers had painted, who nobody would see them except other writers. And I just thought that was in Peru, which to me is kind of a, you know, it's, it's not on the top of everybody's graffiti awareness list. <laughs> um, and so, in fact, I've told a lot of people about that, that place. What was that place? Yeah, where was it that? was an abandoned factory in San Martin de Porres in Lima. Okay, an abandoned factory. Good, I'm glad. Um, I almost burned one down in Lima. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, other places, for example, and uh, Jaime is, you weren't in Tahiti, right? But Jaime was in Tahiti. Were you in Tahiti too? We, we've been invited to Tahiti several times for graffiti. Now, who would ever think that an island, a beautiful island <laughs> like Tahiti, would, that the Tourism Bureau would want to invite graffiti writers to paint in order to attract tourists. I mean, <laughs> and I, I went there three or four times to Tahiti, so that I put that on my list of unusual places. Um, I've been to Senegal for Festagraph, which was a primarily a graffiti festival. Uh, as opposed to a street art festival, because mo most of the festivals are more about uh, painting big walls, street art, not so much about letter style graffiti. But I am going to Congo next month for a graffiti festival, so that's going to be amazing. Um, you know, that's, is that good enough? Those, those are some of the <laughs> highlights. I mean, uh, there have been so many wonderful places, but Peru is definitely a highlight. And thank you for bringing me. <laughs> And I should also say that Mire organized an exhibition with many of these pictures at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Lima. And most museums of contemporary art have not done anything with graffiti yet. Yes. It's certainly not in the United States. But mm -hmm. I mean, what is more contemporary than graffiti? Yeah. Nothing. True. Nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Really, I mean, it's like they're not, they're not looking or something. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Sorry, in fact, Venecia, uh, right now, the festival of Venecia, there is nothing about street art. In Venice. You mean the Venice? Oh, in the Venice. There is nothing yeah. about the street art. So mm -hmm. yeah. And that's it's a shame. That is a shame. Yeah. yeah. That is very short-sighted. How about stupid. in New York? I haven't been to the uh, Biennale in New York. Yeah, I was. Yeah, that one. They, but they had a separate section in that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm, it's odd that people have a blind spot. We have another question there. Uh, hi, yes. So my, my question would go to the three of you, so, uh, but it's a two-in-one, so you decide uh, whoever goes first. So what and when was the last thing, impression or moment, or whatever you want to call it, that uh, blew you away completely? Say that, the last what? The last, like, street art related thing that blew us away? It's not necessarily street art related, anything. The last thing that blew me away. And how about <laughs> how about the cover of <laughs> the, the one up? Um, oh, that you know, yeah, that was I pretty was, impressive. Yes, <laughs> that was when we I, left that place. Martha said, "Talk about vandalism." <laughs> 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 that was. That was like, I mean, that if was you actually, talk about being blown, I mean, that was about... And it was a funny story as well, because that was like during traffic hours. So there was people there. And yeah. then we decided we run in with the crew and we had like, you know, our scarves up to here and our hoodies down to there. And so we're like the crew with all the fire extinguishers, I think like 15, 20 people yeah. all running down the stairs. And then all hell breaks loose. They're like... Yeah. <laughs> fire extinguishers yeah. going off. Somebody said, mine isn't working, mine isn't working. Man Marty understood the police is coming. Yes. Ran, <laughs> ran back out, ran back out. Then she realized nobody's following, so she runs back in. <laughs> <laughs> am I going to be able to, if, this is live stream, am I going to be able to get back into Berlin after this? <laughs> and then, anyway, um, yeah, and then I mean like, that blew me away, I would that put that up on the blow me then, away you know, list. And then we run out and we run out and then like we're sitting in the car and then you know I'm like why did we really run in with them? Why didn't we just stand on the platform like all these other elder yes, ladies yes, with their cameras? Yeah, right. And then she looks at me and she's like because it's more fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Wheezing like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 well, 
But yeah, so that was, was like that yeah. was hardcore. Yeah. But it was a lot yeah, of fun. It also. was a lot of fun. It but it wasn't me because this Martha Cooper and Ninja K. Yeah, I had nothing to do with that. Who do you think? <laughs> I saw it on video. Who do you think Ninja K is? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was that's that. Any more questions? What is what was yours? Like that blew you I away. I can't compete with that. So well, how about like the saying. sunset over Manhattan? Yeah, that, that one. You that away, one was right? definitely mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. That I can imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> I got a question because, like, in the graffiti scene and also the breaking scene, we always talk about like female and male gender. So my question about like queer people. And what are you doing to like support queer people, or what are you doing to make them visible? Mm -hmm. Because in like graffiti, there's like so male dominated. I always see like guys running off, like doing back drums and running to train stations and the whole cars and stuff. But like there are like so many people invisible, mm -hmm. and mostly I think it's like queer people. Yeah. So can you maybe name like name some artists, some queer mm -hmm. artists, or what are you doing to support them? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. those those are two <laughs> queer dudes that are work the, the curators <laughs> are pretty queer. Yeah. People always think that we are a couple, but we're actually not. No. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. supporting queer artists. I mean, I support any artist, w whether queer or not queer. I did though, like in 2013, I was working in Saint Petersburg in Russia, and um, I had a radio interview, a live radio interview. And so I was talking to the host, and then when the music was playing, he asked me how, what I felt about Russia. And I told him that I liked working in Russia, and I had good friends there, and I liked coming to Russia, and the company that I was working for was applying for a year-long visa, visa for me, so I, because they had like six or seven jobs for me in the coming year. And then I told him that Putin, with the new gay propaganda laws, I said, Putin is taking your country back to the Middle Ages. And then he asked me if I would talk about that live in the radio show. And I said, of course. I said, I have a lot of queer friends. It's important to me. And um, so I talked about it on the live radio show, and the client canceled all my jobs. And I never got back to Russia. <laughs> And that's why I'm wearing the Ukrainian flag today. <laughs> one of the reasons. And one in 2000, and was it 2009 or 2010, me and some friends, we organized a hip hop festival in Berlin called Hip Hop Coming Out. And we did it in cooperation with the Schmule Museum Berlin. And we had like basically all queer artists there. Yeah, mm -hmm. What's like your feeling about it? My feeling? Yeah, do you have like, is it like getting more known or like? I think it is getting more normal. I think like because you, you guys, you know, you're not spring chickens anymore. So, you know, like it was, <laughs> it was harder for you back in the day, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was why, don't, why don't we let them come? Let them come. Yeah, yeah. What? No, why don't you? You two should say something to everybody. Yes, he's going to the microphone. Oh, oh, oh to the microphone. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's very important to know that art knows no colors, no boundaries, and that yes. sex orientation. But I think it's very important to also note that institutionally, the art world has cast out women, people of color, and queer uh, people. Things are changing. Steven and I have been doing this for 15 years together, and at the beginning it was a little difficult, but it has been gotten better and better and better. And um, there are many queer artists openly working as queer artists today, graffiti artists and street artists. It's not, I think, my place to name them, if, but it is my place to say they exist, they are very proud of how they feel, how they are, who they are. And I think it's, we're, doing a, we're doing a great job, I think, at promoting the art we all here. At promoting the art of all people. 
-hmm. I yeah. think it is important. It is important. And yeah. I am very grateful to the young people that stand up and challenge us and ask us, what are you doing for queer artists? Because I've been working so long, I've organized many festivals and events for women in hip hop, especially because of like, the way women were portrayed in the media. You know, women in hip hop are all sluts. And we had met these wonderful women working in hip hop, like B-girls and graffiti artists, and they were such a great role model. And we always tried to get that out there. And it was really hard. Like when we were organizing the Weeby Girls Festival in Berlin in 2008, it was the world's biggest festival for women in hip hop. And it was in Berlin. And MTV is in Berlin. And we were on the daily news. We were everywhere. Like I, I did spend a lot of money on PR because I wanted to get the image of women in hip hop that I know I wanted to get it out there. And MTV said it doesn't fit in our format. You know, and I was, I couldn't believe that that happened. So, and then hip hop has also always been very homophobe. So then in 2009, the year later, we decided we needed to do something to come out there. So we had this event called Hip Hop Coming Out. But I am always very grateful. Like I was at a girls festival last year at uh, Queen 16, and we had this panel with women. And then also like one of the girls said, we're not talking about queer artists and queer dancers. And I need to like challenge myself to not only think from the perspective of a woman. You know, there is other things. I was fighting for the women so hard that sometimes I forget the queers. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for reminding me. Any more questions? I see somebody in the back. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Sorry if I'm taking time from your glass of wine. I will, <laughs> I, I will be fast. <laughs> Thanks for... We have time. We have <laughs> lots of time. <laughs> but it's already time. <laughs> Thanks for everything. Uh, I would like to ask you all, what do you think brings more or less when graffiti is going to a canvas or legally. Because I think, for example, of fire extinguishers mm -hmm. and they wouldn't exist in a legal environment. No. Mm -hmm. uh, like many other things like fast tags, uh, fast throw-ups and fast tiles that are developed to be in an illegal environment. What do you think it's adding value to make it calmly at home? Mm -hmm. And what do you think it's taking it away? Because, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like, taking it away? You yeah. cannot take that away. Yeah. But I think on the canvas, you cannot be uh, as spontaneous uh, or uncontrolled as you can be like with a fire extinguisher, you know? I mean, of course, you can use that in a studio on a canvas, whatever, but still there is this frame, and whatever goes on the frame goes on the frame. So it's not the same. Also, you don't have the context. I think the, the very important part, that's also what Martha has kept, like, captured so well, is the context. Like, how does it look when the piece is going on a train in Manhattan or wherever? Um, and I think this is something that is being taken away, of course, from a canvas. But on the other hand, if you take a canvas that's really powerful and really well done by a street artist or a graffiti artist, and you bring it into the white cube where it was not before, and that was pretty much a closed space, it some suddenly opens doors again, you know? It also adds to something that wasn't there before. And also, uh, if you work in the environment of a museum or a gallery in a space that you wouldn't find graffiti usually, um, it's like a new playground, that's how I see it. Um, it, challenges you, it challenges you in a different way, and it also opens up your mind in a different way. Um, and you don't know where it goes, but I think it's also a good thing. So, of course, there's always something you lose, but there's also something you win. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Marta, if you want oh, to answer. I need to answer this. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if this directly answers the question, but for me, uh, I love the idea that as you say, say you're walking through the same space a lot, for example, in New York City, the new things appear. It keeps you 
attuned to your environment when you see a, any graffiti, graffiti, large, you know, fire extinguisher or little sticker, large or small. I mean, it's like an, a wonderful treasure hunt in the city. In a, and a city is a built environment that nobody, we cannot afford to build buildings. But we can change that, we are, writers can change that environment by painting a big tag on, the, on a wall. And it's, you know that that has been done by hand, for example. And for me, that's an exciting thing, to, to walk in a space that I've walked many times before and see something new. And Nika, I mean, now with my cell phone, I'm, I can take these pictures. It, it makes it more interactive for me. Um, so I love like public art, whatever you want to call it. On a canvas, I'm not so interested. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I, for example, to look at your, your work is wonderful, but I love seeing it paired with the yeah. outdoor work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the inside work kind of gives, gives it a new dimension, mm -hmm. but without the outdoor work, I wouldn't, you know, I'd probably walk by, yeah. I and, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. not, exactly. not look at it in the same way. So really, as, as a combination, uh, yeah. they work well together. Yeah, and That's I mean, I we, we like to see skills, you know, yes. we like to see skills yes. and a lot of people tell me like all oh, these graffiti writers, oh, there is a beautiful wall over there, but then look at this where they just, you know, they destroyed this house and they had the tags there, but, but then I mean, a tag can be so beautiful mm -hmm. and so skillfully done, like right. we just saw one yesterday right. that mm -hmm. we really enjoyed very much. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw it again and again and again, and again, and again, and again <laughs> because the guy like tagged the whole flipping street right. and we admired his stamina and his style because mm -hmm. that tag was beautiful and also like, I mean, Try to do that with a fire extinguisher. Try to get that done with a fire extinguisher is really, really hard. So we like skill, people that are like talented and artistic and show it, share mm -hmm. it with us. And we're yeah. grateful that mm -hmm. they share it with yeah. us. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any more questions? Asked and answered. Nobody has any more questions. Okay. Okay, then who wants to buy books and get their <laughs> books signed? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I want to say thank you again. I want yep. to say thank you to Martha for being here and joining us and to Metsy. And yeah. to all thank of you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's go sign some books. Thank you, yeah. What, right here? Yeah. Thank yes. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Can we take this off? I don't know. I guess so. Yeah, I think we can take it off. Okay, my brother wants to take a picture of us. Yeah, maybe we can get.